Over 38% of people will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime, and cancer affects the family and the support system of the patient in some profound ways. We're talking about Cancer Care Ministry, next on Significant Insights. Hello and welcome to the program. Good to have you with us. You know, hearing the words, it's cancer, can strike panic and fear into even the most calm and composed individuals. I've heard those words. In fact, on three occasions, I've received a cancer diagnosis and I've had to go through cancer treatment. My first diagnosis came in my 30s and I was worried that I wasn't going to survive and that my young family would be left without a provider. But going through my three bouts with cancer also deepened my relationship with Christ in a way that nothing else could have done. When I got the last cancer diagnosis about 10 years ago, I can honestly say that having been through the refining fire that cancer had brought into my life previously, I faced that diagnosis with less fear and more trust and more faith. I also knew that I wanted medical providers who would not just treat my body but would minister to me spiritually and emotionally in a holistic kind of a way. And that's why I chose the Cancer Treatment Centers of America. And there I met Reverend Percy McRae, who has been ministering to cancer patients and their families for the last 22 years. Well, you know, as I said in my introduction, uh, I am one of those cancer survivors. Uh, <clears throat> when I was diagnosed with cancer, first place I called was Cancer Treatment Centers. I had known uh, some of the people there yep. and said, uh, I want you guys to treat it. And one of the things that I discovered at cancer treatment centers was it was a, there was a genuine caring. And in a time when medicine is very impersonal, they look at your wristband yeah. and you almost feel like a wristband without a body. Um, th they were very personal. And they, they incorporated three things that I think are important. Uh, the scientific, of course, but also the naturopathic, the nutrition, and so forth, but the spiritual, and that's what you have done. Why do you think, Percy, that's so important? You know, it's interesting. I got into the healthcare ministry quite by accident, you know, Jerry. I had a, a friend or someone that I knew that was working at the time at the Cancer Treatment Centers of America, and I was fresh out of Bible college there in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I graduated from Rama Bible Training Center, uh, Kenneth Hagin Ministries, which was yeah. a constituent of uh, Oral Roberts. And I was focusing on going back to Illinois uh, to become a pastor, to start my church. And this person badgered me and said, listen, please. And so submitted my resume, sat down and spoke with the leadership. Uh, they hired me. And uh, when it all was said and done, I almost missed God because I was not sure if that's what I should have been doing. And so here I am 22 years later. And the thing that really stands out in my mind on what really took place was the fact that uh, I had no idea how important the subject of faith, medicine, science, prayer, and religion, and how convoluted that conversation was and the strain and the tension between the worlds of medicine and science and faith and religion were uh, 1.6 million people are being estimated to be diagnosed with cancer. So it's a huge subject and we need to understand the fact that many of those people are people of faith sitting inside of local churches. Well, it, it brings up an interesting point. You know, how, how does the church deal with the whole health issue, especially, especially cancer? Uh, I, I know in some cases, having been a cancer survivor, mm -hmm. they really don't have that much intentional ministry to people who have serious illnesses, especially cancer? Well, cancer still is that, that conversation that has the wall of silence around it. There's a sense of fear, and then there's a sense of silence because people don't know what to say, don't want to necessarily share that publicly with individuals. We've certainly seen that happen with some of our great spiritual faith leaders who contracted cancer and kept it very quiet. Uh, it, it's just that type of conversation that people didn't know what to say or do, and I think that that's very true with the faith community. Now, things have changed significantly in 22 years since I've started uh, in this type of ministry, where initially churches would not 
talk about this. Pastors would not even mention it well, outside it, it, of praying for people. But, but it's interesting, uh, you know, you came out of a, a, a Bible training situation mm -hmm. uh, with a heart for ministry. Sure. And when somebody called and said, uh, we would like for you to consider chaplaincy in a health facility, well, no, I don't think that's ministry. Correct. So, so there, in your mind, there was a disconnect. Yes. Between the two. Yes. Uh, how did you how did you resolve that? And do you see the same thing in the church today? It's it's a paradigm shift. The history of medicine and science uh, fundamentally has had tension with the community of of religion and faith, and vice versa. Neither of those disciplines historically have been comfortable with each other. Well, they don't, they, they, uh, don't give each other credibility. And so with that, they're, they're basically fighting over who's in charge over what happens to people with regard to the scenarios of sickness and disease and illness. And of course, then the fundamental question becomes around intellectualism and, and you know, learned science behavior versus spirituality that can be deemed as kind of spooky and kind of philosophical, but not based in any real uh, science per se. And so over the years, uh, that has been a strained, com almost combative relationship. And so the faith leaders didn't particularly respect doctors and the doctors didn't particularly respect spiritual leaders. And so for me, I had an opportunity to learn and understand that there is a way for these two disciplines to mutually coexist. With Did you run into some of that awkwardness when you first took the position? Absolutely. There were some old school physicians who didn't particularly care much about the idea of allowing faith or prayer or religion to be part of the environment of medicine and science. And I certainly found a lot of hesitation from spiritual leaders who basically said to me, listen, we pray for our people and we just rely upon the Holy Spirit and, you know, the gifts of the Spirit, which I certainly believe and, and adhere to as well, but did not really feel it was necessary to have a health care conversation. You know, Percy, it's interesting because I, I grew up in a Pentecostal home mm -hmm. and we believed strongly in divine healing. Absolutely. My mother was an interesting woman. When I was a kid, I used to be sick a lot and would have very high fever. And my mother uh, had a philosophy. She called our pastor and she called our family doctor. Okay. And her philosophy was they both have gifts that are important mm -hmm. and I'll let God figure out which one to use. Mm. Pastor Evie would come, lay hands on me, pray for me. Sure. And there were times when uh, Dr. Fry would get there and all my fever would be gone. Mm. And uh, he would say, well, looks like the preacher got here before I did. <laughs> You're going to be fine. You're not going to have to have a penicillin. The next time I might have to have a penicillin. Mm. And my mother never had an issue with that mm. because she saw the two as both gifts from God. Yes. And God could do with either one of those. He could use a doctor or he could use a pastor and she didn't care which sure. just so long as her son got okay. Absolutely. And that's, it, it's been hard for us I think to come to that point. Probably the guy who did that best or tried to do it best was Oral Roberts. Correct. Well he was certainly the person who became very vocal and very focused around the idea for anyone who's ever visited Tulsa, Oklahoma and the, and the property of Oral Roberts University, there's a, prayer, there's a set of prayer hands on the property. And I'm told the history of that is that one hand represented faith and spirituality and belief in God. The other hand represented the idea of medicine and science. Oral Roberts was a trailblazer in championing those dual roles of faith and science and healing. More with Reverend Percy McRae on how the church can minister to those with cancer right after the break. Cancer is a community disease. It's a family disease. And if you're part of a local church, it's a church disease. You don't think about it like that, but anyone connected or surrounded by that person somehow is being impacted by what's going on with that individual.
Welcome back. Today, Reverend Percy McRae from the Cancer Treatment Centers of America is talking about the role that churches can play in ministering to patients with cancer and their families. I started a program called Our Journey of Hope, which basically trains local churches uh, with a free curriculum on how to start cancer care ministries inside of their local churches. And we have seen phenomenal response. We can see more. Uh, we've trained probably well over 4,000 churches. We have now an international presence with pastors and churches. You know, we live in a day and age that people are very concerned about how they look, how, how their health overall, exercising, dieting, and that now has become somewhat part of the mindset of acceptance inside of the local church, which is exciting to hear because now we're beginning to embrace the idea that we're not fighting against or with medicine and science, that we're in support with and in orchestration of healthcare as a whole. And again, going back to the scriptures, every good and perfect gift comes from above. Medicine, science, nutrition, all of those schools of thought are gifts from God. And the local church is now really beginning to embrace the idea of the amalgamation of that with medicine and science. Well, what does it mean when a church embraces it? Particularly some of the larger churches, they have health care ministries now, many of them, not all of them. Uh, I'm thinking of a particular church that uh, I have had the opportunity to work with in Virginia. They had a staffed member on their, their ministry staff who focused on nutrition, health, and wellness. Paid position inside of the local church as a health care ministry. That's almost unheard of 20 years ago, 15 yeah. years ago. So there are churches who are starting to embrace and understand the fact of having an exercise class. You know, with all of the property and the facilities that a lot of the churches have now, we should have an exercise class, a Zumba class, uh, someone talking about nutrition and well-being, uh, health fairs. So there's bec there, there has been this shift of embracing the idea of wellness, health, medicine, science, faith, and religion, and spirituality, that they can work together and they're not opposed, they're not fighting each other. And that's a very good thing to understand. I assume that there then has to be quite a bit of training to help people, and that's what your curriculum is about, to help people understand how you deal with someone who has cancer yes. in the church. We did an informal survey with some churches and pastors across the country to find out what were the top three or four or five things that they spent a lot of time addressing from a spiritual leadership perspective? Marriage relationship problems, financial issues and struggles, and dealing with the issues of health and wellness, and specific on top of that list was cancer. And of those three, local pastors began to express that they could find resources that supported them and helped them to be able to understand how to train and empower themselves around those conversations of marriage, relationship, finances, but nothing with respect to health and wellness and cancer. So we decided to own that space and begin to fill that void. The other element was, was the conflict of approaching uh, sickness with regard to medicine and science versus using my faith. Is that a conflict of my belief system? Going back to your earlier analogy, yeah. as a young boy and your mom calling your pastor and your local doctor, there were still pastors and faith orientations that were struggling with that, with that theological question. Am I, am I a person of faith if I seek the help of medicine and science? If, yeah, if I, if I recognize medicine. And I think that was why it was so remarkable that it was Oral Roberts who was one of the first within the faith community to say, we can bring this together yeah. and we should. Here's the real rub. And it's the elephant in the living room that we don't want to talk about, particularly from a faith orientation, charismatic Pentecostal background because our theology historically has told us it's an either or proposition when we pray for someone for their healing. If they receive their healing, then God receives all of the glory. But when we pray for individuals for their healing and they die, we have no response for that. We don't know how to react to that. We don't know what to say about that. And so we kind of just run and hide and just kind of sweep that under the rug because in our theological misgivings, God didn't get any credit there. We can't praise God. And that's a, it's such an unfortunate fallacy. So providing focused ministry to cancer patients, people really became nervous around the idea, well, what if someone dies on my watch? And I've seen pastors struggle with this. I've had pastors say to me, what do I say to my congregation after we fasted, we've prayed, we've had a healing service, we have anointed this person, we've declared that they're healed in the name of Jesus and they die. 
now my theology has got a hole in it somewhere. I don't know how to react and respond to that. And, and without realizing that by saying that, they're, make, they're trying to make themselves sovereign over God. That is correct. And the Bible says that it's appointed unto man once to die. That is correct. Uh, and to, to, to say that I prayed for that person and they weren't healed. That is correct. Then takes it out of the will of God and puts it to my prayer and takes a, a certain amount of sovereignty away, away from God. Uh, and I, I think, you know, I had people who would come to the hospital say to me, uh, when I was going through surgery years ago for colon cancer, and they would say, why don't you just get up and leave? And, leave. Mm -hmm. and I said, because I don't sense that's what the Lord is having me to do. Absolutely. I kind of went back to what my mother said. Absolutely. You know, God's given this guy a gift, and I, you know, if a pastor comes in and prays for him, and I, I'm healed, that's fine. Otherwise, um, I'm going to use the balance here. So ministry first starts with being connected with someone and showing them the love and compassion of Christ. We do not get to dictate the outcome of that ministry of love and compassion. That's where we get disconnected and our wires get crossed and our thinking about ministry around that sickness. I, and that disease. I think that I have to make an, uh, an outcome. That's that correct. My spiritual ego is such. That is that, correct. That how will I, what will happen to my reputation? And my spiritual reputation. And I, I think a lot of times it's not so much God's reputation as that person who prays for healing feels that it's their reputation. Absolutely. And uh, I, I think we do. I think we have to leave the outcome to God. And sometimes we don't even have to have platitudes. We don't even have to just sometimes just sitting with people, listening, yes. holding their hand, praying for them, and looking them in the eye and sitting there with them is probably the most important thing you could do. And I actually tell people it's almost like a caricature of one of the superheroes, comic superheroes. I almost see a cape flowing in the back with theme music. Faith Man is here today to save the day. And the fact of the matter is we don't get to dictate those outcomes. We're there to simply be the love and the faith, the hands and the face of God in the midst of very interesting circumstances and love them wherever they are and whatever ultimately happens, and God still receives glory for that. And we get that's where we get disconnected, and, and, it, and it throws us off for a loop. And so therefore, we then become silent around the subject. Cancer is a community disease. It's a family disease. And if you're part of a local church, it's a church disease. We don't think about it like that, but anyone connected or surrounded by that person somehow is being impacted by what's going on with that individual. We now are seeing and hearing more churches Actually, pastors repenting, saying, wow, I just missed it. I didn't understand the value of this because cancer is not the fun ministry. Cancer care can't be fun like a lot of the other ministries in churches. It's hard work to be intimate and to be committed to individuals for the long haul because this is not a sprint in many cases. It's a marathon. If you'd like your church to start a cancer care ministry, you can get more information at the number on the screen or by going to our Journey of Hope Dot com. Final thoughts on suffering right after this. You know, I've been wondering about a few Bible verses for a very long time. Hebrews 5, 8, for example, says of Jesus that he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. So does that mean that the suffering was good?
You know, cancer, like all serious illnesses, causes suffering. The Bible has a lot to say about pain and suffering. One thing we know is that Jesus suffered. And we know that His suffering was something He took on willingly for our behalf. Above all, Jesus knows and understands what we're going through. Brad Righteous, Senior Pastor of Living Truth Christian Center in Moraga, California, talks about suffering in today's final thoughts. I walked a mile with pleasure. She chattered all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and ne'er a word said she, but oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. You know, I've been wondering about a few Bible verses for a very long time. Hebrews 5, 8, for example, says of Jesus that he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. So does that mean that the suffering was good? 1 Peter 4, 19 says that there is a suffering that is in accordance with the will of God. And I think about the blind man in John chapter 9, where Jesus said of him that it was neither he that sinned nor his parents, but it was in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. So does that mean that his blindness was a good thing? And I think of Joseph back in the Old Testament, my goodness, thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, accused unjustly, and winding up in prison, and yet he saw God in all of it. He said to his brothers who were responsible, three different times he said, it wasn't you who sent me here, it was God. As for you, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. What a perspective. And then, of course, the Apostle Paul with the thorn in the flesh. He thought it was a bad thing, but God said it was a good thing, that it would be in Paul's weakness that the strength of Christ would be per perfected in him. Back in 2014, I received a gift. I'll call that gift Parky. And I didn't understand it at first, and I certainly didn't think of it as a gift at the time. But it turned out that it was a tool a tool in God's hands, and the good thing about the gift was it came with an instruction manual. And I started to read and study the instruction manual, and I found out that this gift, Parky, was one of the greatest gifts that God had ever given me. You might have already guessed what it is. It was June of 2014 that I was diagnosed with Parkinson's. And do you know, as I mentioned, one of the greatest gifts God ever gave me? And some of you might be thinking, you know, Pastor Brad, that's great, the attitude, uh, taking a lemon and turning it into lemonade. Well, I'll let you be the judge of that, but I can tell you several things that God has done for me through this gift. It's caused an intimacy with Him to blossom and to grow like never before. And it's caused an understanding in me to grow with regard to Proverbs 3.27, which says that a man can receive nothing unless it is given him from heaven. And I'm so keenly aware right now that the ability to speak, the ability to think, the energy to do both are amazing gifts from God. It's also developed in me a far better stewardship of my own body. I've revolutionized my nutritional habits. And having had a heart attack in 2008, my heart is healthier than it has been since before, the heart attack. But probably most significantly of all is this gift from the Lord has birthed in me a compassion, a compassion for other people, a love and a care that I've never had before, which is resulting now in greater effectiveness in ministry. You know, Ecclesiastes 7, 13, and 14 says something curious. It says, Consider the work of the Lord, for who can straighten what God has bent? In the day of prosperity be happy, but in the day of adversity consider, the Lord has made the one as well as the other. Do you think that it pleases his loving heart to cause us a moment's pain? Oh no, but he sees through this present cross the bliss of eternal gain. So he waits for you with a watchful eye and a love that is strong and sure, and his gold does not suffer a bit more heat than is needed to make it pure. I appreciate Pastor Righteous being with us on the program, and thank you for some incredible insights. And also, I, I really enjoyed spending time with uh, my good friend, Percy McRae, from Cancer Treatment Centers of America. I, I remember the first time I was diagnosed with cancer. It was actually colon cancer. And it was a, it was a stunning, sobering moment for me. But I'll never forget, Shirley looked at me 
and with complete confidence, spiritual confidence, she said, you know, I've always dreaded that word coming into our home. And she said, now it's here. And you know what? It's not that scary. God can carry us through this just like he's carried us through everything else. And that's a word that I want to have for you. Uh, you never know when something like this may enter your home. We never know when suffering may be a part of, of what's happening in our lives. But I want you to know, God can take you through all of that. That's why trusting God and understanding who He is and knowing Christ is so absolutely essential in our lives. And in all three occasions that I've, that I've gone through a cancer diagnosis, diagnosis and treatment, it's always been with a trust in God that God can get us through this. Thanks for joining me. God bless you. I'll see you next time.